Tonight's guest is Trip Braden. Now, Trip is an executive coach who works with clients on their go to market strategy, leveraging their team's strengths to create a unique position in the market. So, welcome to Scale Yourselves podcast, Trip Braden. Well, thanks for having me, Jess. Looking forward to a great conversation today. Yeah, well, we've known each other for years, haven't we now? Um, maybe about, what, five or six years or so, considering the, we're at the other end of the pond for one, or one another. I was going to say, it's kind of amazing how well we get along, considering we've never met in person. <laughs> and we've been you, doing it for a long time, so we're actually pretty good at it, I think, at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've been practicing long enough for this, haven't we? We have. So, Trip, first of all, tell me more about building diverse supplier networks. This is a unique area of, of your business that I think will really help the listeners here. Certainly. I, I think part of it is changing the game from the point of view of diversity and inclusion. I believe the best way to have diversity and inclusion is have businesses, not just the people involved. So what I'm saying to my clients and my larger clients in particular is you have to build a more diverse ecosystem. So part of that conversation has to be, how do we do that? And I think it's very relevant now in light of what's, what's uh, happened in the UK and America, not just COVID, but you know, in terms of um, getting a fair um, share of, of, of the pie in terms of business opportunities. Well, I think the other part of it is we have to, uh, you know, people like myself who are gray, uh, have to kind of go in and, and try to have the conversations where we can. We, I can walk into an office of a, a senior executive of a multi-billion dollar company and say, look, if you want a supplier network like this, we've got to give them the skills. We've got to train them and help them be be better business people. We've got to provide uh, leadership um, initiatives that help them develop their people in a cost-effective manner so they can compete. And we also have to be able to provide uh, long-term team coaching so that our organizations understand the critical nature of what we're trying to accomplish. And how is that being received more now than it would have been 18 months ago? Well, you know, it's funny. I have a client that's over 100 years old, uh, and they've been very actively involved. They have a $4 billion diversity initiative. So when you look at that number, uh, they've always been very serious about it. I think the late to the party comers are the people that we're gonna have a great opportunity with because we can actually help structure these kinds of discussions. We can have candid conversations about some of these things. And I think obviously with the new administration coming in as well, uh, the vice president is very actively involved. And I think looking at, looking at helping businesses do better with this. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of see it as a nice opportunity for us to reset as a country uh, that will ultimately set out to the world as well because if we can show examples of why this works for people, I think we're gonna get a lot better results. And it's, it's results driven. Uh, so I think 18 months ago, I, I, most of the progressive organizations I've known have been very engaged in this. IBM is certainly engaged. Salesforce is certainly engaged. Uh, uh, many of companies I've worked with, uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, Adidas, these companies are already involved. What we're doing is fine tuning that. And then we're going to try to scale it. I think, you know, I've been involved in um, diversity initiatives in, in the UK going back in the 1990s. Um, I was part of uh, the African Caribbean Finance Forum where we created the first conference and the first ethnic minorities careers fair. Um, and it's always been that the US has led the way on diversity, having that as part of the agenda and corporates taking that on board. And sadly, that has continued and we're in 2021 now. And certainly Europe, but including UK, has really lagged behind in uh, um, activating all aspects of, of the culture to give them a fair fair access to opportunities. And this is kind of on the business front, corporates supporting uh, smaller businesses and helping them to get access to the um, supply chain. Well, part of it, I think, is, in, is all about the ecosystem and, and how slowly uh, Europe has adopted some of these technologies that will allow for them to enable better suppliers chains. You know, look at blockchain, some of these other features. Uh, really give the advantage to the small business person, but the small business person still needs the infrastructure to support it. And they need to know how they can do that. And we need to kind of jumpstart it, right? We don't want to just go in and say, here's what you do, 
two years from now, you'll get there. Uh, I, I really want my clients, uh, and it, I'm very uh, forceful about some of these things because I've been doing it for a long time, uh, is how do we get people to be more engaged in this conversation and also getting the government involved. I think government and education are having a major role here in what we're doing. It have, always has been. I mean, if you go on the East and West Coast, I'm a Midwest boy. Uh, but uh, ultimately, East and West Coast have always been very progressive in how they look at their supplier chains and how they educate. And they, there's a, sim, a symbiotic relationship between the government and many of these larger corporations. And I think we need to get that here in the Midwest. And we have to get it to the more uh, slow adopting industries. You look at manufacturing, it's very slow in some cases. So the, Europe is behind in some areas, other areas it's leading. So I think it's a great opportunity to really help accelerate the curve back from COVID. Yeah, yeah. And so let's look at the other side. We've talked about, you know, the supplier uh, partner uh, network, but what about in terms of the customers and, and buyers? What is the reason for companies to do that? What are the benefits to the, the customers and the customer customer? Well, I think there's a lot of intangible benefits. And I think one of the failures of the business when we were growing so quickly over the last several years is to look at the intangible benefits of doing some of these things. Diversity offers a true benefit to organizations who supply it and also can acquire talent through it. I mean, the whole idea is it's leverageable and it's, it's maximized, right? I mean, I'm a, as a coach, I maximize opportunity, right? I maximize opportunity when diversity issues because there's a lot of opportunity to learn new things and develop new capabilities and, and co-develop. You know, this idea of I, the word I'm using for 2021 is co-destiny, right? So where do we go from here as organizations that we have a co-destiny together? And if you look at some of the people I look up to, they've been very effective at doing this. The other part is we have to get people in business leadership roles that are diverse to have different kinds of training than they typically get. Most of them are hardworking people, and that's a great thing. But I think there's a lot of ways, a lot of shortcuts we learn, and we should be that shortcut. I think the companies who are buying should help provide some of that kind of shortcut with what they do. So that's where I kind of see as an opportunity, as a very symbiotic relationship, and then also get education involved, right? I mean, that's I wrote an article for Automotive last year uh, for the Automotive Conference Global and about the new form of education and how we can change it. That's the other piece of this. The secret is accelerated learning, right? So how do we get there? And I think there's another piece in terms of innovation uh, as well. And the language that uh, organization may speak internally and how that best communicates with the customer and, the, and understanding what the customer needs is. If the internal organization is reflective of the, the customers and, and the buyers, there's, there's, there's not like a language barrier. There's a clear understanding of, of the needs. And when that doesn't happen, then companies are very introverted uh, rather than being really clear on the, on the customer needs um, that can bridge a lot of those cultural divides. I don't know if you have a view about that. Well, I think part of what you're talking about is, is how do we incorporate customers into discussion? I mean, th this population has been underserved for, for generations, and now we're trying to bring that back in. And it, it's not just putting a, a person of color in an advertisement because that makes it feel good for everybody. It's got to be a product that's driven. I, I, I know for myself with hair, right? I mean, I'm a multiracial person, so I have the hair problem. Uh, you know, many of the beauty products that we use, I don't use many beauty products. I'm like this naturally. But uh, I do use a lot of products for my hair because it, it, it's just very hard to deal with. We're now starting to see those kind of products being introduced in the market. It's same with uh, uh, feminine products that are real and, and genuine that map well with the population of who they're working with. We can't not include the customer in this discussion because they're going to empower organizations to be more and do more. Uh, and, and drive that. And I think that's where there's a, a tremendous opportunity, not just to do it as a, you know, put somebody in there just because that's what we're doing, but we're actually creating products and services for them that are transformational in their own lives. Yeah, yeah. So what's your view on if B2B sales has shifted enough to be buyer and customer centric? Well, I, I think it's interesting because I think with this, like we're in now, I think it's sales become a more of a, a sales uh, become a sport, a team sport, right? So I think that one of the things that is happening and needs to happen uh, for right now is the people on the front lines who are talking and interacting with the customer on a regular basis have a good feel for what's that customer's going through. 
uh, they've got to be brought into the conversation. We have to align sales and marketing teams to be better at bringing back information to the sales team so they know better what's going on in their clients. Your best people to know what's happening are the people you have nearest to the customer. Yeah, and so how does that happen? Well, two things. You have to first acknowledge that the, that the salesperson isn't the only person who has this responsibility. And I, I tend to think, because I come from a, a world like at Berkshire where compensation matters and our compensation aligns with our corporate initiatives. So if we want more frontline integration of what we learn, we have to compensate for that. We have to allow for that to happen. And we bring people into the conversation, uh, even revenue driven marketing, which is a new concept, a relatively new concept uh, in North America, is an idea of how you can get people to do some of this and provide uh, breakthrough compensation strategies, retention. Uh, right now, we're in a situation where people aren't leaving their jobs, uh, but they will be uh, when this reopens. I mean, we are at zero unemployment eight, 10 months ago. I think we've got to really get serious about some of these issues on bringing compensation to the front for many of the people who aren't being compensated today. So what do you mean by this in, in terms of co compensation? Well, I think every, I come from a world where everything is about whatever you, you, you whatever you kill, you get, right? So very aggressive world. Um, but I also think a lot of times you could put bonus and incentive programs around some of the frontline people that don't get it now, that really have no clear objectives. They really don't know how much they're going to earn. They don't get any of the upside. They only get the grief when a customer has a problem. So ultimately, uh, part of my job as a team coach, so to speak, is look at these issues and try to prioritize them so we get the best return on that investment for both the people working in the company and our customers. So you have to tie compensation directly to what, the, what you want done. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a failing effort most times. People don't change just for change. No, they, they don't. But, you know, what, what would you do about, you know, the sales industry is very much embedded to the commission base uh, and uh, for the, the um, salesperson the, in the field, not that anyone's in the field at the moment. So, you know, uh, the executive um, uh, salesperson, there's been a lot of talk, talk about changing that and it's never really um, taken root. So do you see that there's a change in the industry or do you see that something needs to be forced in order for this new way of compensating to be adopted? Well, I think you have to do both. I, I, I think it's, a, it's not an either or solution, right? It's a both and, right? So we have to say to ourselves, how do we change the structure? Inherently, you're talking about an industry. Many of the things we do in sales, we've been doing for 100 years. I'm not that old, but I've been told that, right? So, uh, so part of that is how do we realign compensation programs? How do we align uh, business capability skill building in our sales? One of the things that strike me as, one of the weird things that strike me is when I get calls from people when they think I work for a client, they think I work for that client, not I'm an independent consultant. And the amount of work where they don't have done before they call me is limited. I mean, here we are with this incredible amount of information available to us. And they're calling me and they're, they're, the, the conversation, you're, you're educating the people. Uh, and, and when you have to educate them, you have to talk about business skills and capabilities and what the, our company is doing. Uh, when I, I really think that's something that the employer should be doing with their salespeople. Their salespeople should be great business people as well as good at influence and, 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 and selling. And I think that's going to change because I think we've got, we're now at 72% of the sales processes. We don't even have a, a salesperson involved. So you better, you know, in that last 25 or 30%, you're going to have to accelerate your skill building skills, which I think, and relationship building skills, which are soft, you know, helping them understand what's going on, looking at how you have a conversation, looking how you structure your conversations. So there's a lob logical roadmap to what you're going to do when working with clients versus doing it on your instincts. Um, but I'm not a big fan, uh, you know, even though I do data science for TV, on TV, right? I'm not a big uh, fan of thinking data science is the answer for everything. It's not a silver bullet. I think we'll find that in the next five years. Many of the promises of, uh, of data science have not been fulfilled because they forgot the customer. Well, they forgot the human element in it. And that's the thing that the customer buys. They buy on emotion uh, and not on the kind of logical data. Uh, I think that's very much coming through even now. And especially with COVID 
and a reset in the cells um, process to be more empathetic. So do you not see that a lot of that's changing now? I don't know if you have a view. Well, I have a view, but I, I, I have my view. It comes, I guess it's weird because I'm in an odd place in, in my life where I at this point have been in charge for 30 years. I think emotional intelligence is a critical element, right? I mean, this is a part of what we don't talk about. And, and, and I, I had this conversation with the business school dean last week. You have a great program, but if you don't instill emotional intelligence, I can't predict 20 years from now, and I'm pretty good at predicting things, but I can predict if you're emotionally intelligent, you'll do well. So the, putting that into a lot of sales training, uh, talking about this and having the ability to be more self-aware in a conversation, what I've seen a lot of times salespeople have been very tone deaf to the environment they were coming into. And I don't blame the salesperson because I know that they're getting a lot of pressure from their bosses on getting out to meet with people, talk to people, do all these things. And they keep forgetting their, their people, right? So how do we get to that perspective where our people have those scale, skills and capabilities? But also we have to educate the, the I hate to say it this way because I can get a lot of trouble, but I would say you have to educate the buyer. The buyer has to be more sophisticated in some ways and, and, and demanding of what they want, right? I had a, I think I shared a story with you earlier where I went in and I was really excited about a client, a brand new client called me out of a speaking engagement I had done, had a great rapport first call, incredible rapport, uh, couldn't do anything wrong, right? It was that ideal dream uh, sales call. Uh, but then when I came up with my proposal, I sent it to him and, and he, he, you know, he called me and told me, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed in the proposal. And I said, no, you know, I had listened to, you know, the propaganda that, hey, it's really hard out there. It's tough. So I went in with a very soft price, uh, you know, and probably half what I would normally charge someone for this. And he was disappointed because he, he thought there was a lot more value there <laughs> than I was charging him for. Um, and, and that's part of what we have to teach people is how do you build that value prop? And how do you also have an ability to read? Because I didn't read the tea leaves. I have to admit, I went rushing in thinking, oh, this is great. I'm really excited about doing this, what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't hear what he wanted, which was the intangible of keeping the momentum going, getting somebody, I want to say famous, I guess at this point in my life, I wouldn't call myself famous, but I'm well known enough to be respected in the field. Um, but that's what you have to listen. You have to understand the things people are not saying, especially when you're doing it in this format we're in today. You have to hear the sound between what people say. You have to hear the silence and know what that means. And we're not trained to do that. We're, we're trained to go omni, you know, very directional, very attack oriented. And we miss a lot. And men in particular uh, struggle with that, that capability in, in a new economy. Interesting. Thank you for that, that story. And it's something that all of us need to to, to learn and uh, keep revisiting as well. That listening is, is the key skill, isn't it? So, you know, really listening and also listening to the space, as you say, what isn't said as well. Well, one of the things that I think we also have, and I, we talked about this earlier a little bit and we alluded to it is, we have an ability to listen a lot more closely than we ever have before. We have, I mean, if you would have told me 30 years ago or 20 years ago, even five years ago, the kind of information I'm going to have available on any customer I want to talk to tomorrow and how quickly I can get up to speed on things and how I can learn from people uh, with the different social media platforms and social listening and social selling, I would have said, no way, there's never going to be a time where I'm going to be able to go in and people are going to be fully disclosing themselves the way they do in, in these social platforms. Yet it, it, it's been proven over and over again that they have those skills that makes a significant difference in how you appear in the market and how, how you approach somebody. Absolutely. And both of us are, are social influencers and have been involved in uh, and using social media for, for many years. And uh, I think sometimes don't we, we forget that actually other people there, we are pretty early adopters, but other people that have come late to the game are not aware of how much information um, that they can quickly garner on the, the person. One thing that I always do, even if it's someone I know, um, whenever I have a, a call, I always look them up because they've refreshed their platforms. They've got different things to say. There may be other leap off points that I can gain from what they've said in various posts. I'm amazed at how many people um, contact me, ring me and have never looked at my, my platform, um, my LinkedIn. They haven't read it. They know nothing. All of the awful social media messages um, that we get on, on LinkedIn. And you think if you only read my profile, 
<laughs> you would answer that question yourself. Um, so it can, social media can be your worst enemy uh, and your, your, your best as well. Well, I, I, there's an opportunity though, I think. One of the things I'm doing with almost all my clients, uh, it's top secret, right? But I'll share it with your audience. And it's, that's becoming employee advocacy programs. I'm getting my employees and my employers and clients getting their teams involved in employee advocacy. They are becoming the next generation of Janice and Tripp. Um, working very hard to help the rising stars to become effective at using social media, both for listening as well as actively participating in the conversations. And I think as we move further down that uh, road, I think employee advocacy programs will really disrupt much of what we consider in the influencer marketing because the people inside have a much better understanding of what's going on, but also have a much more genuine message and authentic message of connection than the one we get on LinkedIn every week from people saying, hey, you need this or you need that, and they've never read the profiles. So I think that's the other opportunity that we're going to see as organizations is uh, we can bring that, we can multiply it by 10x just by putting 10 people on your team together to work on some of these programs. Absolutely. The, the, the power of using your, your, your colleagues in order to amplify your, your message is absolutely incredible. I've just literally this morning, I've done a, a four hour session with a, a company, a global uh, engineering company, and talking to all of the um, leaders about managing their social fo footprint, managing their personal um, brand is absolutely key. Whether you intend to remain with the company for the rest of your life, your customers, your suppliers are looking you up. And so it's really important that you, you take that on board. And when they look you up, it's part of their decision-making process. It has an impact of what you're trying to do even within your company. So it's critically important for employees and executives to, to manage their own brand and uh, take that on board, I think. Well, that's that internal communications piece that we so often see missing in larger organizations. The small organizations, you pass the message over. It's a shared message because you hear it and because you're in the same room or in the same area. Uh, I think that's the other place where we're going to have to play more roles in. You can't limit the conversation, but you also have to understand and share with the people what, what is that common message. I've gone into places where they spend thousands of dollars to get me in a showroom to buy a car. And everybody doesn't even have the same message when they're talking to customers about what's going on. They're not even aware of the campaigns they're running. Uh, and they've spent tens of thousands of dollars on those campaigns to get me in the room with them. And then they walk me out the door because they really don't understand or don't have a handle on how to manage that conversation with me because I'm coming in from a perspective that I saw something I wanted, a particular car or vehicle, but I really was looking for some guidance and they didn't even know about the, their own promotions are going on at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, sadly, we're going to have to do this again, Trip, because I, I know you're a wealth of knowledge. Um, what, um, uh, if you're on a desert island on your own, what's the, well, in fact, let me ask you about your hero. Who is your hero or shiro? <laughs> uh, this year, my, my hero is Mark Benioff uh, from Salesforce. And I think it's because one of the things I'm really propagating among my clients as an activist stance on many of the issues that have taken on in society. Uh, I would say Mark and I don't agree on everything, uh, but what I do love about Mark is we always know where he stands. And I think he's a great example, especially for younger entrepreneurs rising in the organizations in their industries to know that it's okay to have a, uh, an opinion on things. I, I am so surprised uh, many times by the entrepreneurs, I, younger entrepreneurs I work with that don't have very well thought out positions and some of the things that are critical both to their, their own businesses, but as importantly to their clients' markets. And so I, Mark is my hero because I, I heard him offer that he's going to have 5,000 new channel partners in the next three years while we're at Salesforce and a very strong commitment to diversifying that new next generation of partner. Uh, and, and obviously he's been a very controversial character at times, uh, but he's willing to take the heat to get what he thinks needs to happen in our society, which is really the role of the chief executive officer in a Fortune 100 company is having an impact on our society. It's not about just that your organization you're leading I believe, you know, I have a different role in that, but I do believe that's the other part. I love Mark because I think he's been very aggressive on doing things and saying things. Uh, and a sh the second shout out would be to Ginny Remitty at IBM, who really has been very, very active in many of the things. And I see her and Mark together because that's how I met them. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that that's the other part is there are companies are very committed to this. And I think that's where we should invest our dollars and we should understand uh, some of this takes time. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Trip, how can listeners get hold of you? Well, it's, it's pretty easy today. Uh, all you have to do is put my name in and in, in search uh, Trip Braden or I Trip Braden at LinkedIn. It's probably the most current thing. The other place I play a lot lately is Twitter. Um, and that's a Trip Braden, which is my name, T-R-I-P-P Braden and at Trip Braden. Uh, there's no other one except one guy in uh, Texas. Uh, but the other thing I'd say to you is I'm looking at a new thing called Clubhouse and I'm, you may be able to find yeah. me there. I'm getting yeah. actively involved in that platform. Early on, I had a few people invite me in and I, I'm looking forward to ha- seeing that. So you can find me there as well. But I would definitely look for me on LinkedIn or on, on Twitter if you're looking for me in a hurry. And I'm sure you'll see me on Clubhouse if you're looking later on. Thank you for having me today. Excellent. Well. Excellent. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Trip, as, as always. And thank you for being a guest on Scale Your Sales podcast, Trip. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing this and let me know if I can do anything else. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.